Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Andrea. I work for Canonical. I'm in the kernel team. And I would like to talk about kernel testing. And uh, let me start with the first sentence. Testing kernels can be painful and slow. Uh, so what I mean with that is like, uh, so being part of the kernel team in Canonical means that we, we, are, we are providing a lot of kernels with different flavors, different architectures. Sometimes we have to apply custom patches for a reason or another. Uh, we try to be good citizens and upstream as much as possible, but sometimes like we necessarily need to maintain custom patches. And when we do that, we want to make sure that when we rebase with new kernels, we don't introduce regressions. So we have uh, large testing infrastructures, but sometimes when there is a problem or a regression, we necessarily need to you know, put our hands on and, and see what, what's going on. And um, so, for example, I'm pretty sure all of you are familiar with Git Bisect. You have tried to bisect the regressions. And, you know, Git Bisect is amazing. It, it's really effective. It's probably the best way to track down a problem. But the whole process is not like, it's quite painful, it takes time. And at the end, it's rewarding because you find a problem. But to get there, that's not ideal. So, yeah, the thing is, testing kernels can be painful as low, mostly because there are lots of redeployments and reboots involved. Uh, often, I like to start like to redeploy a system when I need to run a test because I want to make sure that a run doesn't affect the next run, the results of the next runs. So starting with a fresh image is always nice. But independently on what kind of infrastructure you're using, it means that you need to wait. And wait time leads to distractions. At least I get distracted. If I need to wait and stare at the screen for five minutes, let's say, I won't. I would just check the emails or, I don't know, go get some food. So it's not even good for my diet. And that leads to unpredictable results, uh, either because I get distracted and I make mistakes or because, like, I don't know, there are infrastructure, the infrastructure fails to deploy. Uh, an image, let's say. Um, and so, yeah, uh, approaching kernel development, that kernel development, I have the feeling that we are lacking the usual, you know, fast edit, compile, test workflow that we have with user space applications. Uh, if you work on a user space application, you just apply a patch or do it, make a change in the code, you recompile and, and you dot slash the application, or you just click a button and the application starts. Um, so yeah, having to do a lot of these tests uh, was making my life miserable. <laughs> and I was like, you need to figure out a way to speed up this process. Um, and uh, yeah, I was wondering, what if I can like, be able to create a virtual copy of my entire system on the fly? I can meaning like I can kind of fork my system and specifying a custom kernel and create like an ephemeral image where I can do whatever I want that would be an exact copy of my system where I can do all the changes that I want in a safe way. And when I'm done, I just stop power off the machine, the virtual machine, let's say, and I'm done. Uh, in the way, in this way, there's no redeployments involved because it's just a immediate, you know, start immediately. And I um, can show you we, with some tricks, we can achieve also extremely fast reboots. Um, that doesn't save like the time, that, like during a bit, git bisect, for example, that doesn't save the time needed to recompile the whole kernel. Uh, but yeah, I, let's address that into a separate topic because now we're focusing at the deployments and, and reboots. Um, so I started to look around see if there was something. And I found this amazing project called VertMe that is written by Andrew Lutominski. So a big shout out to him. Because this tool allows to do what I was looking for. It allows to virtualize your running system, like create a live snapshot and specify a kernel that you just recompile or that you download the package and 
Oh, no, no, you have a file with a kernel, you specify the kernel, and it creates this live snapshot. Um, it uses uh, 9PFS to export the host file system into the guest uh, in read-only mode, because it's supposed to be safe. Like if you destroy your host, it, it's pointless. You can just reboot into your, your host. And writes are allowed in a temp FS home. So uh, how many of you are familiar with Virtmi already? Raise your hand. Oh, so many people. Nice. So yeah, we should use Virtmi. I'm done. Let's can go to lunch. <laughs> now, the thing is, I was super happy uh, when I found this tool, started to use it. But there was like, let's say it was covering like 80% of 80% of, of my needs and but there was still like a 20 percent that i wasn't happy about um and yeah so this is the thing that I wasn't things that i wasn't happy about uh, first one is limited testing capability meaning that exporting the file system in read only mode makes impossible for example to install other packages and i'm still limited to do certain tests um, the other thing is performance. Even if like 9PFS is amazing and we had some uh, big improvements in the 9P protocol with 5.15, uh, still the performance were not like pretty cool. Uh, for example, just to give you an example, a git diff in the Linux source directory was taking five minutes to complete. So, yeah, cool, but uh, certain I couldn't do certain tests. Like it was just impossible, um, and as a consequence of that, also the boot time was not ideal. Because like it was take, it, it was amazing. Like it was taking like uh, 16, 15, 16 seconds to like get a console and me being able to run commands. But I felt that there was room for improvements. Uh, last but definitely not least, uh, pro the project is not maintained anymore, sad face. Uh, that was quite disappointing. I was quite disappointed about that. So, because at some point I was sending pull requests on the GitHub page, other people were, <laughs> you know, Marcos, other people were doing so, and they were just sitting there. Um, so, yeah, but hey, that's the beauty of open source, so we can see the source code. We can fork that and yeah, and this is what I did. I also contacted Andy, the author, and for personal reasons, it doesn't have time to maintain this project right now. So it was like, yeah, sure, just fork it and, and continue that. So I, that's what I did. I tried to look at the pull request, uh, merge what I, what I liked. Uh, and we created a new GitHub project with that. Uh, and I did some improvements. So this is a summary of the improvements that I have done, along with many others, but these are the, the most relevant, I think. Um, so the first one is moving from 9PFS to VertIOFS. Um, so VertIOFS, we, we will see in details in the next slide. But VertIOFS is, again, a file system that allows to sh you to share like directories from the host into a guest. And uh, you know, it's more efficient than the 9PFS. It requires a little extra infrastructure, let's say, on the host, like you need to run a daemon on the host. Uh, but yeah, with some little tweaks and works, uh, we, we were able to support VertIOFS. And the other one is to use overlay FS across the entire root file system that is exported in the, in the guest. And in this way, we can provide like read write access. It's all ephemeral because it happens like inside the guest in an overlay FS. Like if you try to install a package, you can now. Uh, and this increases the, the amount of possible tests that you can do. Like, let's say you need to install a package and you do want to pre-install the package in your uh, in your golden system on your your uh, real host you can do that now um, the other ingredient let's say the, the, the thing that I added is to try to use uh, micro VM I wasn't aware of micro VM 
before. I just, it was actually um, a guy on, on Twitter suggested me, like, because I was tweeting about, uh, you know, my progress on improving the boot time. Oh, I, now I'm one second faster, two seconds faster. And, and at some point, he was like, oh, you should definitely try micro VM. Uh, it, it's in QMU, it's like upstream. You can, but, I mean, you can, but you, you'll see, I get I have some results later. Um, and uh, the other thing was to, uh, so the original project was using a bash script. It's a custom init script. It was not relying on system D, uh, mostly because the original design of this project and it's still the, the design to, is not to become a distribution, like a fully featured distribution, but the goal is to provide like the bare minimum environment so that you can do something. Um, that's the reason for the custom in its script. However, the bash implementation was relatively easy to maintain, but not in terms of performance. It wasn't amazing uh, for obvious reasons. So I decided to re-implement the, the same script, basically, to kind of translating that into in, in Rust. Uh, the decision behind Rust uh, is mostly because I wanted to learn Rust <laughs> and I needed to find a project. Uh, but at the end, well, it ended up being a nice choice because we can really improve boot time performance moving from Bash to Rust. And I have to say, like, in terms of maintainability, it's, it's good. It, it's not bad. I mean, it, it, you can, I, I even tried to do that in Python because I was more familiar with Python. Uh, terms, in terms of maintainability, amazing. But in terms of performance, it wasn't actually giving much benefit from having the, the Bash implementation. So, yeah. Um, yeah, this is, this is a, like, like, a, a getting into more details of the different things that I added. I just want to mention that um, Virtio FS is, can provide better performance, mostly because uh, the, so the real IO happens on the host through the daemon. So it's the daemon that it runs on the host that performs the actual IO and file system semantic is exchanged using the fuse protocol. Uh, and then there's like a shared memory area where like all the, the IO app happens on the host and the data is copied on this shared memory area. And then the, um, yeah, then the guests can immediately see like the files that are read or written. Um, and uh, yeah, it's an amazing project, uh, really nice. And yeah, so this slide, should be put on the homepage of Virtio FS, I think. If you see the first result, uh, I was pretty surprised to see that, like the, the, the git diff uh, in the kernel source directory that I mentioned earlier, that was taking five minutes. After moving to Virtio FS, that takes like 1.7 seconds. So with this change, I can, I was feeling very excited, like I can uh, almost give the uh, feeling that you're actually running in your host rather than in a virtual machine. Uh, and um, yeah, so like um, th this one is, is is a good result. And and Git diff is, I mean, we see this huge performance boost because Git, Git diff is generating a ton of file system requests and that was tanking the 9p way because 9p needs to uh, generate basically a, a message for each file system operation and also the io goes through the 9p protocol while with virtio fs you just you know send the semantic and then the actual io happens in the host uh, the boot time was improved as well not like amazingly better but still um the, the, the reason is that during boot time, we don't have much file system operations. But still, you know, um, well, we can save some time during boot. Also, I want to mention that I regenerated these numbers from using this, the latest version of virtmeng, uh, because like along with this change, there are 
the, I did so many improvements that if I would compare like an older version with a newer version, we would get just, you know, even better results. But I wanted to make sure that I was measuring the actual file system performance rather than, you know, side effect optimizations. Um, so, yeah. Overly fast, this one is straightforward. Uh, was a yeah an easy change to in order to be able to support and, and give the feeling of like you're actually using it. It looks like you're using your host because you can write whatever you want in the file system. You can read your emails. You can delete your emails. You can corrupt your file system. You can do all the writes that you want. And when you're done, you just power off or you exit from the session, the virt me session, and you didn't actually do anything. It's just you get, you, you get back to the to your golden image. Um, I want to mention, this is something, so the last one is something I want to mention. We had a bug where something odd was happening, uh, like we were getting permission denied errors, uh, and that's because like Vert, uh, Vertio FSD in the host runs in uh, unprivileged mode, and you're you know, it's supposed to access the entire file system of your host. OverlayFS instead is using, uh, is implicit, implicitly injecting oh, no a time uh, on any file system operation. I, my understanding was that it's doing that for performance reasons. But the result was that this oh, no a time was sent to Vertio FSD running on the host. So it, if it was trying to access, let's say slash bean bash. It was accessing that with no time, but being an unprivileged uh, unconfined binary, couldn't you can't use no time, so I was getting permission denied. But anyway, long story short, this is fixed upstream because uh, in Vertio FSD we decided to do like if you're running unprivileged, unconfined, and you don't have permission on a file, we can we, we just drop all no time. And I wanted to mention this because if you're using this and you're like, let's say you're stress testing or oh, no a time, well, make sure that you create a import a separate disk because you can do that in VertMeNG. You create a file system there and you're not using, using the actual, you know, virtual, uh, virtio FS exported file system of your host because you may get weird behaviors. So don't waste time on that. Um, and yeah, last one, the, the, well, not last one, but another improvement, the micro VM architecture. Um, so that is just, you know, you, you can pass some options to QMU and it would boot this micro architecture design to, to optimize boot time and memory footprint. Um, it doesn't have PCI or CPI, so you can save some time during boot. And as you can see, like the results are it seems small, but if you use this, this tool to do mass testing across different kernels and in parallel, let's say, these small results can be significant. Uh, and still, it's, yeah, it's small in absolute time, but in percentage, it's like, uh, yeah, two, like 2x, you know, <laughs> it's twice, twice as fast. Um, and yes, last last point was to re-implement the init script in uh, in Rust. That was also a big improvement. So when I say boot time, 1.2 seconds, I mean that let's say I recompile the kernel, I just make, just finished. If I type VNG and I press enter, after 1.2 seconds, I'm able to run commands inside this virtualized system. So it, it's pretty cool if you like, let's say you're working on a bisect, make VNG and you can run your test case. So that's quite amazing. Just showing some graph for the things that I said, so I already said that. Um, so I was supposed to show a demo, but I didn't want to mess up with the whole setup. So <laughs> I'll just say, if you want to see the live demo, just stop me approach to me and we can i mean i have a laptop with everything installed there's also i also made a video just in case uh, but 
so if you click on, on that link, the, the slides are available on the LPC web page. Uh, and basically, I can describe what I was going to show you. Like one of the first example was this one that you know you compile the kernel, you type VNG enter, and you are you have a session shell inside uh, with the kernel that you just recompiled. And in there, you can do anything that you you would you anything that you would do in your into your host. Uh, another example was to like you can use BertMeNG to run. Uh, scripts like batch commands, not interactive sessions. Uh, so you can like specify a command and it would run that in the virtualized environment. And that's cool because you can, um, like I implemented the possibility to use standard input and standard output. So you can literally combine like commands on your host, pipe something that runs with this kernel, pipe something that runs with this other kernel, pipe another kernel, pipe collect everything on the host and print the result or send the result via email, for example. And in this way, I can like parallelize, let's say, I don't know, 10 kernels all at once and collect all the results on the host. Uh, and, uh, and it's pretty fast. I was supposed to show a little live demo of four kernels and it completes in 2.6 seconds. Uh, so yeah. Um, oh, and the last uh, the last uh, example was to show you that you can also use this tool to test graphic, uh, to run graphical tests. Uh, and uh, if you watch the video at the end, there's me running Steam on my client inside the weird me ng session, and I start a video game, Baldur's Gate One, by the way, it's a cool game, old 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 <laughs> good old Baldur's Gate One. And you can hear the audio, you can play the game, uh, it's not lagging, and everything is running inside my, the, the micro VM architecture. That's pretty cool. Um, so, yeah, conclusion. Um, yeah, I would like to highlight the fact that maybe BertMeNG can be used to finally have this um, fast edit compile test uh, workflow, also for kernel development. Um, also testing a kernel in, yeah, one second, a little more than one second is nice. Uh, and I, I put one second that these are the results on my laptop. If I use this in my beefy server at home, I can break the barrier of one second. I can push this down to 0 0.8 to 0 0.9. Um, another point is like, uh, yeah, it's this. I want to. So everything is backward compatible with the old BertMe. So if you use the use BertMe, everything should work. Uh, if it doesn't, it's a bug, and please file me a bug. I've heard some people saying, "Oh, I moved to BertMe and G, but this particular feature, this particular command, doesn't work anymore." If it happens, please. Please let me know. <laughs> I can fix that because we fully support, like, want to fully support backward compatibility. Um, and another important point that I want to mention is that the usability. I have the chance to um, work with students. Um, yeah, it's a great opportunity. It's nice. I, I like it. Uh, and usually, newcomers or especially students, when they approach to kernel development, they they are super excited, but the, all of them, they struggle when you tell them, like, you should test this inside a virtual machine. They're like, oh, no, now I do, how do I deploy a virtual machine? I don't know what to do, and they get discouraged. I, if, if, when I showed them this tool, they were like, oh, okay, it's amazing, because kernel development is not that difficult. So it's like, I think it's, you know, potentially a way to attract uh, new people and I think that's that's interesting. Um, I also wanted to mention, I put the last point because that was actually a, uh, the topic of one of my previous talk at the OSPM this year. Uh, and I was, yeah, I did a talk on how to reduce power consumption during kernel testing using VirtMeNG. So I put the link on the, of the presentation at the end of the slides if you're interested to get some values. But uh, to, yeah, to summarize everything, the idea, of course, was that 
you can save the time, redeployment time uh, by using VertMeNG, so that that's why you can uh, you know, be more carbon efficient during kernel testing. Um, so what's next? So the, the goal of this talk is to like make awareness that this tool exists, uh, increase the, the user base. Uh, I know there are users, um, some example of people, some people in, in SUSE are using this one right here, Marcos is using in um, for testing light patches. Uh, there are people from Google that are using it. Um, people uh, that we have, we also have a Debian maintainer now that maintains uh, the package in Debian. His name is uh, Ricardo Ribalta, big shout out to him. Uh, and so that means we have this package also in Ubuntu and all the Debian based distros. Uh, so you can just up install with me and G. You don't get the latest version that gives you all this amazing performance, but we, we try to be aligned to the latest version. Uh, otherwise there's a, you know, there's a code is on GitHub. You can download that, compile. Um, so yeah, the, but, but the, the main point uh, for me is to collect more feedback. So, because now it's been pretty much designed to satisfy my own personal requirements and maybe a little bit of Marcos as well. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we, 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 need, we would like to improve this tool more. Um, another thing that I would like to add is the, but it's not a priority right now, is to su fully support system D. Uh, this is not, it's not trivial because system D uh, has like its own state so basically when you clone your host into the guest uh, uh, and you try to restart systemd on top systemd finds a previous state and it freaks out <laughs> so uh, in order to fix this we need to kind of mask with overlay fs the previous state like deleting the previous state and convince systemd that it's running on a fresh host fresh booted host um, the downside, though, is that it is not going to be fast as the custom init script. Uh, will be still slow, but we can support like more tests. So let's say you have a test that requires a systemd-based daemon to run. Then you may want to use systemd. Um, in, for example, in Ubuntu, at some point, I wanted to add the support to run snaps. And in order to run a snap, you need snapd, that is a systemd-based daemon. So if you don't have systemd, snapd won't start. So what I had to do is to, to like kind of trick snapd uh, and convince it that there, maybe there was a systemd running by creating a fake state in overlay FS, right? Uh, so now snapd is convinced and it starts and I can run snaps inside VertMeNG. And there's a dash dash snap option to do so. It's not enabled by default because you don't want a uh, snap D running maybe by default. So you have to explicitly enable that. Uh, another point is improve the support across distributions, but I think we're in a pretty good state now. We have like the Debian package, Ubuntu, all the Debian derivatives, and um, people are working to provide an RPM. So if we cover Deb and RPM, it's, well, pretty much cover everything, I would say. Uh, snaps, flat pack, I would, I would like, that, that's probably a consequence of the systemd support. Like if I, we can properly support systemd, then we can properly support any other, uh, you know, packaging that requires demo running. Uh, snap support is working. I would even say it's stable. Um, but but using this tricky Aki way. So is it reliable? Maybe, we don't know. Um, yeah, put some references here. If you wanna try the tool, that's the, the homepage. The second link is my previous talk about power management stuff. Uh IOFS, QMU, some references. And I think I am done. Questions? Uh, 
Uh, thanks for this work. I think uh, you merged one of my patches, so appreciate oh. that. Um, uh, I, one thing I could never quite get to work right in VertMe was uh, like uh, totally unprivileged uh, non my non root file system thing. So like I pull down somebody else's user space and I want to just exec that, but you know, I can't extract it as real root. And so I have to do some ID mapping there. Have you thought about, does it work? I haven't tried. Uh, have you thought about uh, Yeah, I don't understand exactly the specific use case that are trying to do, but I, so are you, are you using still 9P or vert, vert IOFS? Uh, either one. Uh, right either now, I'm one. still using 9P actually, but uh, mm -hmm. I could switch. My goal is just like I'm an unprivileged user. I want to extract some root file system and then run it in a kernel. But then I want to be, you know, real root touching the files as my unprivileged well, so, user. So theoretically, like if the Q, because at the end is a QMU process. Yes, exactly. Right? So if QMU has the permissions to access whatever you're trying to access, then you can. If QMU doesn't have the permissions. Yeah, there was. I, uh, yes, it's, it's, I see what you're saying. Like we should do something like give boost temporarily the permissions of the yeah, the, new image. You can like kind of hack it. I just didn't know if yeah. this is something you're interested in supporting. Fully. So one thing that I that is similar probably that I that I try to solve is let's say because we in Vertme and we support like multiple architectures. Uh, so. If you don't have, but, but okay, of course, if you are on x86, let's say, and you want to start a virtual ng session on RISC V, of course, you cannot virtualize the root file system because the binaries are just incompatible with the architecture that you're trying to virtualize. So that's why there's a dash dash root option mm -hmm. where you can specify a different directory. So actually, this is exactly my and use case. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, and if the target directory doesn't exist, um, VertMeNG would actually create that for you, downloading the files from the uh, latest Ubuntu cloud images. Okay. I did that just for me because uh, Ubuntu, uh, <laughs> so I use the Ubuntu cloud images. But to do that, uh, so it gets the image, it untars everything, and of course everything comes uh, as root ownership. So. The trick that I used is really dirty. I'm just running chmod mm -hmm. to give permission to access those files. Uh, but uh, yeah, right now that's the only, but it's a good point. It's a good point. We should investigate something to see if it's possible to, yeah. yeah. Thank that you. That would be useful. Thank you. Yeah. You go. I'll yeah. Go next. Hello, Andrea. Uh, thanks for your, your work uh, on VertMeNG. I believe that it would be nice if you could mention some other open source projects that are already relying on VertMeNG. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So uh, Matter, for example, is switched to VertMeNG for their CI, CD uh, workflow. And uh, yeah, they're happy with that. So they can test like is their uh, workflow or I, I should say their requirement is to be able to test Matter across different kernels uh, from different distributions. So they couldn't find a way to easily and quickly, you know, cover like download all the kernels and then, okay, you have all these kernels, but I don't want to deploy a single VM for each kernel. I just want maybe to use my, uh, a, a, I don't know, a cheer root with the latest matter installed and they can individually pick each kernel and just you know, create a weird me and G instance and just test all of them. Uh, so they are happy with that. Uh, I know someone, I don't know if I can disclose this, but uh, let's not say any names. Company X is testing webcams with Bird me and G. That sounds odd because I was surprised because I was like, wait, how, how do you test web webcams? You're creating a virtual image. And, and the guy told me, uh, well, we just use, we can, you can specify uh, additional QMU options and what, it, what they're doing, they simply pass like the USB, uh, create a USB a device, kind of pass through uh, into the VM and, and therefore they're able to test uh, uh, webcams uh, over US, virtual, virtio, USB, whatever, uh, running different kernels. Um, other projects, yes. Uh, Marcos is using Lightpatch to test Lightpatch. 
There are probably others, but these are the ones that, that I know. <laughs> um, yes. Is it is are these VMs compatible with uh, connecting to them with uh, GDB? Yes. So there's there? a, there's actually a, a dash dash debug option. If you use that, you can uh, the, the VM will be start with a um, GDB listener, and then uh, I'm trying to remember because I implemented that and I don't remember. There's a virtmng command that you can use to uh, uh, basically um, how to say to it would use QMU, uh, QMP protocol and you can generate a, a crash dump basically and when you have the, if you want you, you can generate a crash dump and inspect with that with crash utility or, and breakpoints and all that oh yeah breakpoint or whatnot yeah cool thanks one one question behind, behind you yeah Okay. Yeah. yeah you. So thanks for maintaining that. Uh, that I really appreciate that. One question. Um, in my case, mod probe doesn't seem to work very often mm -hmm. because it's trying to look for the, the the host place for the modules. Is there a way to solve that problem? So mod probe, whatever driver I I want to install, look at the the kernel that I just compiled. Okay. So mod probe used to be a tricky problem to solve uh like how what version are you using because i think that was solved recently because before like it was uh, difficult like uh, we had to, so we had to do some tricks like right now we are uh if you let's say you build you just recompile your kernel okay uh so what we do is to uh if you point to the current directory let's say you instruct me and g to run the kernel from current directory that is the default behavior it would implicitly run and make modules install insta inside dot vert me mods uh, and do some magic sim linking uh, and over uh, and actually mount dash dash bind inside the guest to show your uh, modules directory inside lib modules kernel version so inside the guest uh, you should have transparently uh, installed all the modules. So if you run mod probe and you have some dependencies, it should be able to pick up the right the right modules. Um, yes, Marcos. Yeah. Oh, also, there was a problem that we fixed recently. If you are using a distribution that that currently uses the user merge, it should sh it should try to to load the modules from user lib modules, right? And this was uh, fixed recently. Yeah. So maybe that's that that was your case. At least that you seem to fail on open source tumbleweed, but that's fixed. Yeah, and, and another problem that I found, but this is on Ubuntu in the latest version with Mantic, was that so in Ubuntu we decided to move to XZ compression compressed modules, and that was causing troubles. So now that's also fixed. Like if you use XD compressed modules, it it will unpack them so you can load them inside BirdPNG. So uh, my question is uh, very related to this uh, topic, uh, in fact. So uh, one of the use cases that we have is we would like to build an, an, an init RAM FS uh, to launch with VertMe. It's currently possible to pass in an image, um, but the struggle is uh, signed modules. Um, so, there, uh, so are there any future plans, uh, for instance, to update the current uh, init RAM FS uh, functionality within VertMe to um, support arbitrarily building uh, RAM FSs, so we don't necessarily have to pass in hyphen hyphen installed for the installed kernel, and then install our modules um, in our root file system. So we can just pass in a kernel image, pass in a, in a RAM FS, have a boot. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're asking this because that's one of the things. Like I, right now, I, I need to test sign modules, and I'm not able to do that with VertMeNG. It's one of the things that is sitting there in my secret to do list. I haven't looked at that because i don't have much i mean i i know something about sign modules but it's not my expert main expertise and again that's the goal of this talk like collect feedbacks and this is one of them like that yeah mine is boost priority of my two secret to-do list yeah i currently have a hack for this at the moment but it's kind of messy so i figured it'd be nice to have more support around building yes, yes, complete in it RAM F is swap out busy box for something else if we want to and things like yes, that. Yes, that's a that's a good a good 
feature that I would like to add, yes. For your modules, um, when you bind mount them in, is that a live mount or are you um, copying to something within the guest? From the perspective of if you modify the module on the host, does that reflect into the guest immediately? Uh, so if you, like, let's say you already started a vert me and DG session, so the virtual machine is already running, uh, and you haven't touched the module into the guest, any change that is done on the host would be immediately, uh, you know, uh, visible to, the to, to, to the guest. Uh, if your guest touched the module being a copy on write way, of course, at that point, as soon as you write something in the guest, they, the two versions diverge. Yeah, just from personal experience, um, you might want to figure out a way to surface that to the user so that they don't recompile their host kernel and then end up debugging the wrong module. Yeah, that's, oh yeah, that's a good, a valid point. Yeah, because the module may change underneath. Yes, and especially if you <laughs> yeah, remove yeah. the module to reload it with different parameters, oh, yeah, that's, that's and then valid. you've got an entirely different module and you sit there scratching your head for a while. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, that's a bug, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't tested the virt uh, IO FS yet. I'm still using the 9P and there is a minus minus read write option. So I believe that everything yeah. that you write down, it's, it's, uh, it's so updated. The, yes, there is a read write option, but even if you use, uh, oh yeah, because in that case we won't create the overlay on top. I think so. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. but, but it's, you know, it's read write is kind of it's dangerous. dangerous. Yeah. Uh, but if you like the, the <laughs> what I ended, if you like, yeah. if you're brave oh. enough, but just oh. yeah. Yeah. at least so you can specify specific directories to be read write. So it's yeah. not that dangerous. I just have my like um I lot the modules binding so that you literally cannot add changes from uh, the see, host. I see, I see. So um, yeah, now, yeah, so okay, you mentioned something interesting that uh, I wanted to highlight. Like, is that I even in the talk before this one, I I always hear people, oh, that because I'm doing this or I'm doing this, I'm do and it's great. Uh, and another a big goal of work me and G would be to like provide a common tool to everyone, so that if, like if you don't have, if you're not super expert and you don't have your little tricks here and there, you can start with that. So if you like a newcomer, say that you have anything that you can start with this one. Yeah, and from a KVM side, it sounds like you don't always use KVM, but um, if you did for you, new users especially, uh, utilizing KVM trace points from the host to glean information about what's going on in your guest. And especially if you are brave enough to hook up uh, BPF programs, you can extract a lot of information about the guest, especially if you have, um, like, on x86, any kind of exception. Uh, we can often trap yeah. into information. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty so. useful, yeah. Another thing, too, I don't think it would have to be vert me uh, specific if you're using So if we can get into the kernel, I would love that um, for just any I haven't checked if there are questions in the chat. Okay. No? Okay, cool. <laughs>